August the 20th, 1975, was a very special day for many scientists. It was the day of the Viking One mission to the red planet Mars. As the team of technicians settled down in front of their computers, instruments and monitor screens, the final check of the space vehicle was taking place. Everything was ready. The countdown had begun. This costly space adventure was about to swing into action to prove once and for all that given the right conditions, life could evolve from non-living matter. The basic law of biology states that life can only come from life. Yet, now and again, some scientists suggest that perhaps life could come from non-life. In medieval times, for instance, the scientific world was convinced that vermin and flies were generated directly from rubbish dumps or garbage. In fact, the belief was so strong that in 1668, the celebrated Italian scientist Francesco Redi had to demonstrate, by means of a simple experiment, that vermin and flies breed in garbage, they don't come from it. He placed a piece of meat in three separate flasks. The first flask was covered with a piece of thin cloth, the second with a piece of paper, and the third was left open to the air. Very soon, flies started to enter the open flask and settled on the decaying meat. Although the flies couldn't enter the flask covered with the cloth, they could smell the meat and settled on top. The one covered by paper blocked in the smell and the flies ignored it. After some time, maggots appeared on the meat in the open flask. Maggots also appeared on the thin cloth covering the second flask. The decaying meat in the third flask, however, that was covered by paper had no maggots on it. It was then obvious to all the scientists that the flies had laid their eggs on the meat in the open flask and that these had hatched into maggots. As the flies could not get to the meat in the flask covered by the cloth and could only smell it, they laid their eggs on the cloth. The flask covered with paper had no smell of meat and so the flies were not attracted to it. This flask was free of maggots. Two centuries later, however, belief by scientists in spontaneous generation was again very strong. This time, it concerned the microscopic world of bacteria and algae. They just seemed to come from nowhere. And most people believed they were generated from the matter where they were found. One of the greatest scientists of all time, Louis Pasteur, didn't share this view. He was convinced that the basic law of biology, that only life begets life, was just as good for bacteria as it was for vermin and flies and all other living things. So, before a sceptical audience, he too performed an experiment. He first took a flask, put some broth in it, which he sterilized and sealed it. No bacteria formed on the broth. Then he used a flask with a narrow S-bend top. As the dust or particles carrying bacteria were blocked in the neck of the flask, no bacteria reached the broth. The scientific world was obliged to accept the facts. A century later, the belief has grown again that life can come from non-living matter. This time, it is believed that long, long ago, primitive life had been developed from primitive gases and chemicals. So, all eyes were fixed on Mars. The reason was that its atmosphere and climate, although extremely cold and dry, is more like Earth's than any other planet. Mars seemed to be just what was required, a sort of natural laboratory floating in space that could settle the question of whether life could evolve from non-life. There would no longer be much doubt that life evolved on Earth if traces of life could be found elsewhere.
The Viking space rocket was equipped with one of the technological miracles of our day, a miniature science lab capable of performing all the experiments of a modern university laboratory, but only a cubic foot in size. This fantastic apparatus was lowered onto the Martian surface and the experiments began. It was designed to scoop up soil, analyze it with its ultra-modern instruments, and send the results back to Earth. Of one thing, the scientists felt sure. If life was not existing at present, it would have existed in the past. There were indications that surface water had once been present on Mars. And this would have created conditions similar to those that were believed to have originally existed on Earth. The excited scientists could hardly wait to process the data that was pouring into mission control. Then came the shock. It was more like an immense disappointment, probably similar to that experienced by their ancestors at the time of Louis Pasteur's experiment. They had been so sure that life could be generated from non-living matter that it was almost unbelievable to find out that the Martian soil was sterile. Not only was there no sign of life, but there was no proof that life had ever existed in the past. They checked and rechecked the data, but the story was the same. In case they had missed something, a second mission had been organized. The launch of Viking Two on the 9th of September, 1975, rekindled the hopes of some of the scientists. The new data was cold comfort. It just confirmed the truth that no life had ever existed on Mars. Of course, questions started to be asked. After all, an enormous amount of money had been spent, and the believers in evolution theory were farther away than ever from providing any sort of concrete proof for their belief. The investment had provided virtually nil returns, and taxpayers' money seemed to have been used on trying to justify a belief of a number of scientists in a theory unsupported by scientific data. Some were even saying that the results indicated that the whole notion of spontaneous generation evolution should be abandoned. This program takes over where Viking 1 and 2 left off. Scientists are interviewed who have researched various aspects of evolutionary theory to find out what the present position really is. Many people believe that the fossilized remains of animals proves that evolution has taken place in the past. And to find out whether this is really the 